good. You, you ready? Let me yeah. pray. Uh, Lord, we pray. <clears throat> Lord, we pray. Bless this time together in Jesus' name. Even the video. Amen. Amen. Uh, Matt, would you pause the music? Go. You're recording? Okay. I look at him, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is Jonathan Lehman. This is Mark Dever. Welcome to this episode of Nine Marks Pastors Talk. Well, that's not exactly true. How's it not true? Well, oh, this is going to be more like, do you remember those old leadership interviews I used to do? Uh-huh. This is going to be more one of those. I don't think so. Yeah, I think so. Wait, are you? So are not you? A, not on the topic are I you, have in front, not, not on this. Well, let's say this what afternoon. Do you have? Uh, it's what my do you, stuff. What do you have? You have my intern papers, among other things. But you're really from California, aren't you? I was born there. So are you from California? First uh, first five years of my life. Does that count? All right. From ages five to 15, you grew up in Eugene, Oregon? Correct. What was that like? Idyllic. Really? Splendid. Wonderful. Are you trying to get an invitation back no, to Eugene? No. It, it was it was an idyllic childhood. You grew up in a Christian home? I did. Tell us about that. Uh, Christian grandparents on both sides. A uh, Salvation of Army chaplain mother's dad. Wow. And a godly wife. And then my, my dad's dad, also a pastor, uh, in small missionary alliance type churches in rural towns in Missouri and Oregon. And then uh, my, my own father was a minister of music. My mother taught music. Uh, they were both heavily involved in the church, obviously, and involved us in the church. And you say us. Me and my three siblings. And you're the oldest. Where, 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 where are we going? <laughs> what, what do you mean? What, what is this? Just, just follow me. So you're the oldest? I am a four. Do you share all those traits of the typical first child, eldest child? I seem to combine one set of traits, not another. The more rebellious, nonconformist, you know, firstborn uh -huh. potential track, I yeah. share that. Less the... I'm the rule maker. I'm lording it over my younger siblings and making sure they keep the rules too. I don't follow that track. As and that's much. what they would say. Uh, I'm pretty sure they would say that. Were you, were you baptized as a child at Grace Community Fellowship in Eugene, Oregon? <laughs> were you going through old files like were membership? Were you baptized files? as a child at it, Grace Community Fellowship in file Eugene? File cleaning day or Oregon? <laughs> it's a simple question. I got wet. Would you describe yourself as a rebellious teenager? Yes. Intermittently. Where'd Not you, at all moments. Where'd you go to high school? First year in Eugene, Oregon, Churchill, Winston Churchill High School. The is it still years, named that? It is. Mm -hmm. The latter three, I looked it up recently. Okay. The latter three years, uh, New Trier in Winneka, Illinois. And how was high school? Uh, first year was spent really pushing into rebellion. Latter three years, transitional, because now in this, we went from kind of small town Oregon to wealthy Chicago suburb. And that's because your dad's job changed. Correct. Right? That was a pretty, pretty traumatic cultural switch. I never really fit in in the latter three years and worked really hard at being a nonconformist, wearing weird clothes and stuff like that. So I didn't bring a briefcase to school. I'm not that weird so like some people. Were you doing interviews and writing things back then? I think not interviews. I think it was my junior year teacher, Mr. Ham, who really encouraged me to start writing. I think he liked what I did in class. He told me to get involved in the high school newspaper. I did. I became the features editor. So was it Mr. Ham and Mrs. Beef that gave you the idea that Mr. Nose <laughs> and Mr. I? <laughs> no, that's not where that came from. Um, My own genius. You did an undergrad degree. Seriously? What? what what's? No, I'm serious. Did okay, you? Okay, I did. At Rochester? University of. Uh, 91 to 95? Correct. Uh, why Rochester? You'd never lived there. You no, were from had, Eugene. Uh, and, and uh, It was my safety school, honestly. I didn't really want to go there, but I didn't get into the, I applied to three schools. Didn't get into the school I wanted to. Which was? Georgetown, Foreign okay. Service. Okay. Where Ryan went. Yeah. Well, Ryan's your boss. That's right. Yeah. And my safety was U of R. And the reason I chose it is because they have uh, a premier political science program. Uh, one of the, at the time, it was one of the top five in the country. Uh and I was interested in that. And they also had a study abroad program that I was excited about that ended up doing internships in the House of Commons in the European Parliament, which I loved. So it was it was kind of the political science draw 
that drew me to Rochester. So you double majored in English and poli sci. Ended up taking enough English classes just just for fun. The Lord's providence in your that life, I'm like, man. I, can, I, I had three more, and I have a, a second major. See how he was getting you ready? There it was. Yeah, that's very kind of him. Uh, you first came to the D.C. area to do an internship at Falls Church Episcopal. <laughs> Is that right? It really was file clean out day. Is that right? Yes. Was 19, that 93 or 94? 93. Summer of 93. Uh-huh. Yeah. I visited here also that summer. Right. Well, that's interesting. So yeah, with Jeff Taylor, who's the youth pastor at Falls Church Episcopal, and he was my youth pastor back in, in Eugene, uh, Chicago, uh, Winneka, and said, why don't you come do that with me? And I'm like, sure. So I spent the summer here. Loved it. And did that fit with how your uh, undergrad years at Rochester were going spiritually? No. Talk about that for a minute. Traumatic, dramatic change. In fact, I got into some trouble while doing the, which I don't need to get into the details of, but I... He was making bad decisions while working as this youth group intern, Mm. which turned into having to move from one house to another house Mm. and, uh, you know, heavy stuff. And Jeff, the youth pastor was, was loving though, and, and gracious and, you know, properly reprimanded me, but then also helped me. And so it was, yeah, out of sync with the way I was living. When you were at Rochester, so not down here, not over in England, when you were at Rochester, where'd you go to church? I didn't. Talk about that. I attended a mega church in the Burbs once. I'm like, nah. I attended a, a Methodist church where a woman was preaching a second time. I'm like, meh. I went to an on-campus- Why did you go to the mega church and why did you go to the Methodist church? I felt like I should- I mean, I grew up in church every uh-huh. week of my life. But so I mean, I, why I those like, churches? I, I, I have no I recollection. No idea. Hmm. Um, I went to an on-campus ministry. I forget who it was. And it was a bunch of typical evangelical Christians singing typical evangelical Christian songs. And I remember thinking, ah, I'm just embarrassed by these people. I don't want to be here. Mm. And I never went back. Wow. That was my spiritual uh, exposure while at Rochester. Mm. That was it. And while at Rochester doing that poli sci major, you continued to get more and more interested in politics. Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, I, I remember taking a class on the presidency uh, in the during the ninety two uh-huh. election, uh-huh. and one of the class assignments was reading the New York Times every day uh-huh. in articles on you know, you know the, the campaign and so forth. And oh, no, it was great. I loved it. I took a class I, I, I on the presidency during the nineteen eighty election. Oh, did you really? And James David Barber was the professor. That's uh, great. It was it was so interesting. Um, I, I campaigned for one of the candidates. Oh really? Wow. And I one. will I will yeah. will not. So speaking of all of this, what's a socialist? A socialist is somebody who thinks the uh, government should own uh, the means of production. And distribute and, and accordingly. What's the difference between a socialist and a Fabian socialist? The Fabian Socialists, as I understand it, is a, a very uh, philosophically probably not much, but it was just a, a group of them in the late ni- 1800s. The Bloomsbury Group in London. Early 1900s uh, who joined together to promote some of those ideas. And I think they were responsible in part for starting a, a particular university Called. in London. London School of Economics and Political Science. And so why do some people call you a Fabian Socialist? Because I attended after graduation in 95, 95 and 96, the London School of Economics and Political Science. And you did a master's there. I did in political theory. And why that and why there? To be a Fabian Socialist? Because I finished it. get the, master's training in that? <laughs> well, I would say the LSE is a, a Fabian Socialist school about as much as Harvard is a Christian school. Wow. Right. So was Harvard founded by Christians for Christian purposes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Does that legacy continue? I don't think anybody would say it does. Yeah. I wouldn't say LSC and socialism are quite as far apart as that, yeah. but in that general direction. So I attended there because I loved political theory during my undergraduate days and uh, thought I may do a PhD in this. Mm. And so ended up going to the LSC. 
both because scholarships were provided and because I wanted to sort of test out the question of whether or not I should do a PhD in political theory. And because I loved London the first time I was there in my junior year and wanted to go back. And what did you feel you learned in that master's looking back? I learned to, number one, think critically and carefully. Uh, in, you don't think you'd learn that in your undergrad? Uh, honestly, I, I remember my first week or two at the LSE just thinking, these people are all smarter than me. Hmm. I am just so outclassed. Hmm. I don't know if I'm going to make it. And no, it pushed me really. Oh, I, mean, I was pushed hard at Rochester, not to deny that, but just, you know, newer and deeper ways. Uh, number two, I, I think I learned something about the whole field of political theory and the history of political theory and methodology and various things. So the, the topic. Which has been useful to you in years since. Oh, incredibly. Hmm. Yeah, in ways I didn't anticipate. Like thinking of systems? Uh, learning the landscape of the conversations, especially around philosophical liberalism, which is at John front, Stuart Mill, front, well, his branch of it and, and others, uh, which is what all conversations around political philosophy in these days, political theology have to respond to. You just mm-hmm. cannot have a conversation in these matters in the West, in America, especially yeah. unless you know how to interact with what has been at the very center of it, mm. which is some form or other of classical liberalism. And you want to just define classical liberalism. So people watching this don't think you mean people who don't believe the Bible. Yeah, no, just the idea, uh, just the word liberalism, I think is a good place to begin. Liberal, right? Liberty. Uh, the idea that the foreground of what makes a just society is maximizing liberty. So Calvin Coolidge. Uh, I, I don't know if about Coolidge to offer any kind of comment there, but the, the, the idea is instead of right and wrong yeah. being that which determines what is just, what is unjust, think from a bibl- biblical perspective, justice in the Bible is centered around the concept of righteousness yeah. and those things that implement, apply God's righteousness are just things as opposed to things that are wicked, which are unjust, right? So in in a biblical framework, it's all around a concept of law and right and wrong. In liberalism, you don't begin with right and wrong because we all have our own perspectives on right and wrong after all. So what makes something just or unjust is Mm -hmm. the idea that what maximizes liberty. Now, the founders of Harvard didn't seem to think that. Makes things just and unjust. Founder, uh, 1630s. I, can't, I can't speak to the founders of Harvard. I can speak more to the founders of the Republic. I can speak to the founders of the Republic and I can speak to John Locke and, and, and so forth and say, so no, maybe there was some change much- from the 1600s to the 1700s. Maybe what you're saying was reigning when our country was founded. Well, no, this is the whole conversation right now. To what extent did some of the Christian founders and, and, and so forth. What to what extent were they relying on either natural law or mm-hmm. biblical law uh, in order to uh, establish a clearly democratic Washington republic. Adams Jefferson were Franklin. Well, no, I wouldn't say they were. I okay. would say what most historians, as I understand it, these yeah. days say is there's a kind of conciliance between your enlightenment streams and your enlightenment yeah. men like like Adams or like uh, Jefferson and Madison, yeah. and your more. Christian, sometimes Baptist, whether Isaac Bacchus or, or John Leland, uh, who, who came out these concepts of freedom and liberty from very different from da- foundations. But James Madison found, would be a mixture. Well, James Madison, no, uh, James Madison is very much, an, at least in, in his writings, becoming more of an Enlightenment man. Mm-hmm. He, he's writing like that, and he's, he's saying, okay, the, the, one of the most precious commodities to protect is the conscience. Right, the free conscience, yeah. sacred property, he called it. Right, and interestingly, in one of his letters, he does root it back to Luther. He goes back to Luther mm. and says, "We, you know, we've got this from Luther." Um, so then you get Baptists like Bacchus and Leland saying, "Yeah, that sounds good. We want to protect the conscience because, of course, they're being persecuted by the establishment." churches and so forth and so you got an enlightenment guy like madison and you got a you know a, a, a christian set of uh of writers who 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 are coming to the same conclusions we need to foreground conscience the freedom of conscience as it were almost above all but they're doing it for very different reasons mm. of course but the conversation at that point in american history as i understand it, and again this is this is out of my expertise this is not what i studied right this is just I'm reading some of the same books other people are reading. Um, insofar as you're foregrounding conscience, the freedom of conscience, 
and maximizing that as the foundation of justice. Well, that works for a time. That works so long as your society is a quote unquote Christianish mm-hmm. society in which men are men and women are women and marriage belongs to a man and a woman. And we have a kind of a common Judeo Christian ethic. The idea of foregrounding whatever is just is that which maximizes liberty and protects the conscience. Again, that works. Now, put that into a society where you don't have that same shared set of assumptions about right and wrong yeah. ethics, sexual, marriage, family, and so forth. Well, suddenly, maximizing liberty. And the free conscience produces a very different set of outcomes. As we've seen during our lifetime. So 1992, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, you know, Anthony Kennedy in his majority opinion says something to the effect of men and women of good conscience can disagree about abortion. Notice he's appealing to the free conscience to yeah. substantiate abortion. What does that mean? Well, that means religious liberty, in a sense, is the kind of argument he is using to justify abortion. After all, if, if, if my conscience tells me this thing is not a, is not a life, why should you impose your perspective of whether or not this thing in my, my womb is a life or not? So at this point, you, the particular way of formulating religious liberty is even giving rise to outcomes that the founders didn't anticipate. And it goes back to, in some ways, this consilience, this agreement, this shaking of hands between your Christian founders or pastors and well, folks Patrick like Henry, Madison, I mean, they were, yeah. right? F- folks like Madison and Jefferson, and so that's why all the conversations we're having these days kind of go back to what do we do with classical liberalism, mm. right? I've, I've and all of that is of that what you were you. thinking of in London. Well, in some ways, I was, yeah, I was thinking about mm. an earlier form of it. At that point, the conversation was around this whole thing called the liberal communitarian debate, mm. right? So you had. Classical liberal, or not, well, at this point, more contemporary liberals like like John Rawls. And John Rawls, interesting. A lot of people talk about you know him and as sort of the bad R A W L S. That's right. Originally wanted to be an Episcopal minister, but then lost his faith in World War II, went to Harvard, and then uh, wrote one of the most foundational pieces of political philosophy in the last 60, 70, 80 years called The Theory of Justice in 71. Anyway, he, he says, look, my, my, my work is basically a generalization. That was not the word he used. I forget the word he used. It's, it's kind of a building on the whole concept of religious liberty. And so that's why a lot of our brothers to the right these days are saying, yeah, you Christians who are we calling for religious, religious liberty, liberty you're, you're basically calling for liberalism. Yeah. And you're basically calling for a, a secular state. Yeah. And they sort of pull the two together. And it's, it's on people like us to say, well, no, actually, they're not the same thing as what, what John Leland and Isaac Backus wanted wasn't actually the same thing as what James Madison and Thomas Jefferson wanted. And, and can, can we separate those two things? Um, I lost track of the question you had asked. Uh, I was asking if you were thinking about these things when you were in London. Oh, okay. So yeah, it was, it was the liberal communitarian debate in which you had a number of communitarian writers like Alistair McIntyre and Amata Etzioni at GW and others who were at Michael Sandel at Harvard were coming along and saying, hey, we well, you know, listen, this whole liberal scheme in which the, the individual is the primary political actor doesn't really account for the fact that our identities are born up in the context of community relationships, communitarian. It's my family. It's my nation. It's my all the communities that I live up actually inform what I think is right and wrong, right? Mm-hmm. So you have a very embedded concept of anthropology and human existence and therefore morality. And they're coming along and they're saying, liberalism doesn't account for that. And a lot of what they say, in some ways, it was it was, it was was a form of identity politics, you could say. But uh, a, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of truth in what these guys were saying. And the liberals were saying, well, that may be true descriptively. It is true of my sense of right and wrong and my sense of identity do emerge from my community. But that that doesn't impact uh, what we can then do in the public square. We still need to protect each individual's set of rights in the public square. And the communitarians would come back and say, well, your very concept of rights are, are dependent on, you know, said community. The word means what it means in context. Exactly. And so that was the conversation back then. And that's, in a sense, what my, well, that's why my master's thesis was, was on, in that whole domain. Mm. And uh, so it sort of trained me up in these things. And what was interesting is all of those conversations taught me to be a critic in some ways of liberalism mm. and the excesses of liberalism. I was seeing as excesses and I was seeing how much it was lurching towards a, a godless, amoral, immoral. So uh, a critic of libertarianism. 
Well, libertarianism is one branch of liberalism mm-hmm. broadly. It's kind of it's kind of your most uh, strident. Let's just leave the government out at wherever we can. Yeah. Uh, a, a more socially progressive liberal is also going to. In some ways, it comes down to which which rights do you want to protect? Do you want to protect certain moral freedoms, or do you want to protect certain economic freedoms? And your libertarians are wanting to protect economic freedoms, right? Don't tax us. And your socially progressive liberals like Rawls are wanting to protect certain social freedoms like freedom to abort my baby. But they're all working from the same foundation of maximizing liberty. Hmm. It's just a question of which liberties do you want to maximize. And that, that, in a sense, is the difference between the right and the left in 20th century politics. But they're all working from liberal foundations, hmm. maximizing liberty. right? And through all of those years, I was a critic in some ways of liberty. But then it was interesting in the last few years, Mark— uh, 2021, 22, 23, as some of our, again, Christian brothers started to attack religious liberty, I found myself defending, suddenly defending mm. and leaning into my Baptist ways mm. and saying, well, well, hold on. Let, so let me like pick I, that up more in a minute. Yeah. Let me just go back to your time in London. One other change there is you started attending church regularly. No, I didn't. I went occasionally. To St. Helens Bishop's Gate. The first time I went to London. Yeah. It's junior year, fall of 93. I walk into St. Helens because I'm like, ah, oh, here I am abroad. Let's check it out. And How did get, you know to go there? A funny little building right I in the know, middle of the city. Don't, People don't live right there. I don't know. Huh. But it was an evangelical Anglican church. Oh, yeah. As oh, you know. Oh, my goodness. Dick with, Lucas with is great preaching, preaching. Strong. Yeah. Somebody must have told me to go there. Okay. So one Sunday I go there. I remember the first Sunday I walked in. This was interesting. I, I walked in. I was sitting next to this old lady next to me. And she's like, well, what are you doing here in London? And I'm like, I'm, you know, and she's like, you're obviously an American. What are you doing here? And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm interning for a member of parliament. Oh, who's that? I said, well, a guy named Hugh Dykes. And she said, Hugh Dykes, isn't he a conservative? And I said, yes. And she said, and you're a Christian? And that was mind blowing to me mm. that, well, it, I, I was living in England then. I yeah, yeah. remember the aren't, assumptions you're talking about. Aren't, aren't, aren't all Christians conservatives? And as you know, yeah. over there, the landscape's just different. Very different. Differently, con- yeah. differently. Anyway, that was interesting. And then I went maybe three or four times, but somewhere in there I met. So I went more in London in that one semester than I did back in Rochester. Of but what about years. when you were there for your master's? Well, I met Charlie Hoare. Okay. Our mutual friend. Our mutual friend, Charlie Hoare. Ended up spending Christmas with him and his family down in Alciston, down on the coast, in the little house. Wow. There. Wonderful. Yeah. Delightful. Yeah. Uh, and he and I became fast friends. And so he was he was an encouragement to me, a spiritual encouragement and to me. And a very artful evangelist. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And we had good philosophical conversations mm-hmm. about this, that, and the other. So then when I went back the second time to the LSE, uh, Charlie and I kind of picked up our friendship again. And he mm. would invite me back to St. Helens, where he was a... I would call a member or whatever he was. He was there. And uh, yes, yeah, so I went I went a few times when I was at the LSE. But again, not a lot. Maybe half a dozen. Do you have many memories of that, of St. Helens? I have a few like vague impressions, yeah. Uh-huh. I remember going to a Read, Mark, Learn study uh-huh. yeah. once, mm-hmm. sort of thing. Uh, then after uh, London, you came to D.C. for a second time. I did. September 96. Well, because I'd love the time at Falls Church, or at least the time in D.C., I thought I want to go back to the city. I, I, things went well with my master's degree, but I still had a lot of debt at that point. I had undergraduate and a little bit of graduate school debt. And I'm like, I want to pay that off, get a job. Was that all from your motorcycle? <laughs> no, the motorcycle was free because okay. it was my dad's. All right. All you right. know what? So he and all the elders had motorcycles, Mark. No, you're kidding. And they would ride their motorcycles for pastor retreats around. Oh. I like would love this. Yosemite and all the oh, national parks out west. I would love that. So that's that. what my dad did with the other elders. Dave is so wise. Yeah, right. <laughs> Dave is, the wives didn't object? No. They're West Coast wives. Wow. Different, different, all right. you know, all jam. Right. And so, no. Would we, but this, be but, okay with but, you getting no, a motorcycle? Okay, no, no, all right, all right. But at this point, he's in Chicago. He's like, take my motorcycle. Okay. Anyway, so, no, I, yeah, that's why I showed up on the motorcycle. Um. What was I talking about? Well, I'd ask you when you came back to DC, you know, what brought you back I, I here? Was what was that because, move because about? I, I, wanted, I wanted to pay off debt and I wanted to spend some time um, working on PhD applications for, for in but, political But theory. you didn't end up at Falls Church. You came here 
Yeah. I think my, my, the, the guy that brought me to Falls Church had left. Number okay. one. Number okay. two, my relationships in light of those things that had happened yeah. were just, it was just all awkward. Okay. So, no, all of that was downstream at that point. Okay. Charlie, our friend Charlie, Charlie Hoare. said, You have to go to Capitol Baptist where my friend Mark Dever, uh, or this guy, and I have a friend or guy knows, I forget, yeah, yeah. Uh, is, is the preacher. He's, he's fantastic. You'll love him. You, sh- you should attend. So, and you came and you disliked the music. I don't remember what I thought of the music. Did yeah, I say did. that? Is that what I said you in the membership? It. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, That's fine, man. It was. But why did you keep him back if you disliked the music? Your dad was a minister of music. You like music. Uh huh. So that would be a significant component for you. Two reasons. Number one, your preaching. It was just unlike anything I'd ever heard. And two, the sweetness of the fellowship mm-hmm. was just glorious. The, the old folks, you know, the, the youngs and so but you, forth. You, you not only attended here as opposed to, say, Falls Church, but you attended more regularly than you did in London or Rochester. I went from a non-churchgoer, effectively, yeah. to a three-time-a-week churchgoer. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And and you were here at that stretch for five years, from 96 to 2001. Yeah, uh, why, almost. Yeah. Why the like on-off switch change there? Bible. Brother, you preach the Bible faithfully, plainly, clearly. Um, I mean, I've told this story on a couple of occasions, but maybe in one of these conversations, I, you know, I remember you were preaching through Joshua and you read some verse like, and Joshua went in and slaughtered every, you know, man, woman, child, cattle, sheep, and donkey. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I cannot believe he's saying these things in public. What in the world? Yeah. And then you looked at us and you said, if you're a Christian, you should know why a verse like this is in the Bible. And at first I was a little put off by that. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? You're the pastor. You tell me why that verse is in the Bible. But at the same time, it, 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 it worked in my conscience to say, mm, he's right. God isn't trying to defend himself from me. God is telling me to defend myself from him. Mm. And so it's just in that little moment, my worldview shifted some through your clear, plain, powerful preaching of the Bible. And that was not what I had heard in high school, say, Mm. uh, where Chicago suburbs, late 80s, early 90s, every other sermon had either a Phil Jackson or Michael Jordan illustration. Yeah, those are both basketball references. Yes, those are. That's right. Just in case any of our viewers don't know that. That's right. And uh, it was uh, that was a it, that was a church at the time that was looking to Willow Creek mm. again. Think late eighties, early nineties was looking to Willow Creek and saying, "Let's do what they do." Mm. Now, my church in childhood back in Eugene was was I think better, I'd, but I wasn't really paying attention. Um, whereas you did something very different, and I think it was the power of God's word working together with God's spirit, mm. which was changing, reshaping my heart dramatically. In those years, in the late 90s. And during the day, you were working for Robert Putnam? Uh, the first job I had was doing research for him and one of his colleagues at Rochester. His book in the 90s, uh, Bowling, Bowling Alone, Alone, was That's well right. known. Yeah. So um, if you look deep into the appendix or thank you notes, I'm, I'm, I'm down in there. I was doing research at the Library of Congress for him, mm. coming up with membership data on Masons and YMCAs and all Even sorts of things. Even then, the Lord is sovereignly preparing. Isn't that, isn't that yeah. ironic? And then you teach second grade in D.C. public schools. Hardest year of my life. You and Mattiello at, at Amazon? Yeah, that's it? Yeah. <laughs> you really have No, your, that was really memory, man. There were no notes on that, seriously. I, I mean, carnal reasons... I thought, okay, I've I've got my, I'm ready to go to to uh, apply for this PhD because I got the Putnam connection now yeah. and I got the LSE connection. I'm gonna spend a year working on PhD applications and let me do something that's really kind of cool and interesting to, you know, top tier schools, PhD departments. I think I'll go work at a DC public school as my kind of. Um, you you know, did that for a year. Program. I did it for a year in the late '90s, and it was so it was terrible. It was so hard. Like. Okay, so I, I I thought I would teach history or social studies at a high school. So I submitted my application to DCPS, right? DC Public School. Second grade. No high school called, only an elementary school called. I, I walk into the office. It's, 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 uh, I, I forget. I'm not going to say her name. The principal said, Well, Mr. Lehman, why are you here to teach the second grade? And I thought, A sensible question. I thought, Second grade, that's what I'm interviewing for. Okay. Uh, well, you know. 
second graders, you're establishing a good foundation and blah, 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 blah. I had no idea. Yeah. I didn't have any background teaching. Yeah. And so I answer that single question. And then she talked for 10 minutes about her philosophy of education. And she gets to the end of that. Having glanced at my resume once, not having called any background references, nothing in my background to suggest educator. Yeah. Right. And she says, well, Mr. Lehman, we would be delighted to have you aboard here at Amadon Elementary. Stuck me in a class a week later, no training, 26 desks, 26 students, a chalkboard, no chalk, no pencils, no paper, no books, no curriculum, no help, nothing. I remember you appealing at church at prayer meeting and we would take up offerings and, you know, give you, buy you pencils and that's stuff. A, yeah, yeah. So yeah. The, the supplies I had yeah. came from yeah. the church. Yeah. And that's just a picture of how desperate DCPS was. I think I, actually, I don't know. I assume things have gotten better, but it was desperate in those days. And that's why I was taking just about anybody off the street with a pulse like me and maybe an undergraduate and graduate degree and saying, okay, yeah, you, you do something. And it was uh, in some ways arrogant of me, I would say, to think I could step into a situation like that. 26 kids, as I said, uh, three of them from a two-parent home, most of them coming out of the, the projects that were in Southwest at that point. Mm-hmm. It was before Nat Stadium was there. Yeah, that's right. And um, That's part. It was, it was, I don't know if I did those children a lot of good, frankly, in those, those So re- reflecting on it for you, was that a significant year? And if so, why? I don't, I don't, I don't know. It was a really hard year that I'm, I mean, was the Lord using it? I trust he was. I, you, you, I, I don't know how it weaves into the grand scheme. I, I can't You switched from that to a very different job. You were still thinking about doing a PhD, but instead you decided to become the managing editor of a magazine called International Economy, and you kept editing there for a couple of years. Why? Well, I think, I, okay, here's what the Lord did. I think in part in, at Amadon is he broke me down spiritually, and it was around then I think I was being converted because I was just mm. being humbled daily at work, and that was mm. terrible. And other stuff going on in my personal life was was not good either. And I think the Lord was humbling and drawing me to himself through all of that, combined with the discipleship that I was receiving here. And so then, yeah, an opportunity came along through Claudia to edit at the International Economy magazine. And, you know, in some ways, the the goodness of God has shown and he kind of plucked me out of this one situation and way many people in that situation couldn't be plucked out of, mm. you know, and, and the Lord in his kindness took me and, and, and stuck me in this magazine. And I, I spent a couple of years there editing, which again, I would say the Lord was using to mm-hmm. hone, improve writing, editing skills. For when did you his find, later purposes? When did you find your spiritual concern for others starting to grow? Somewhere in there. Mm. I remember I was in a Bible study with some names I could, offer and you'd, you'd probably remember them and suddenly i just i became really interested in whether or not those guys were growing spiritually mm. it wasn't sitting around reflecting on myself how do i grow in christ you know c.s lewis's quote about humility is not thinking less of yourself but thinking of yourself less mm-hmm. i think in god's grace i just i just began to think more mm-hmm. about other people well that was around the time we redid our church's constitution and we redid our deacon structure and you actually became the deacon of member care yeah that's right how was that that was it, was, it was more of the sweetness I described before. Uh-huh. Uh, the, the deacon of member. I remember you did it well. Was responsible for number one, distributing the benevolence fund. Number two, making sure elderly folks had a ride to church and, and so forth. So it really was reaching out to the, the more struggling members in the congregation and, and making sure they were cared for. And because they had been so sweet to me, mm-hmm. it was easy for me and kind. My heart was large for them mm-hmm. and to help them in those ways and set up rides for various individuals. And I was single at that point. Yeah. And I remember you once saying one of the strengths, the unexpected strengths of Capitol Baptist is all of its single people because they can do lots of stuff. Well, at one point I was one of those single people who was able and had the freedom to do stuff. Yeah. And you did. And so visiting them and helping them was, was, was a great time. And then, as I said, the guys in my Bible study wanting mm-hmm. to know how, whether or not they were going. And so I'm, so I'm, so I'm sitting at work and I'm supposed to edit this thing, or maybe it's a Wednesday night. I'm supposed to go to, you know, some press conference or something. And I'm, I'm thinking about the guys in my Bible study wanting to email them and say, Hey, how are you doing? How was it for you last night? And so forth. And it was those changing affections that I began to look at and thought, I think I want to go to vocational ministry mm. because I could care less about this press conference. I could care less about the mm. things I'm editing. What I care about is the people of God. Well, we were talking about that, which is why then you ended up doing an internship here at the church in 2000. Yeah. How was that? Well, I remember saying to you, Mark, I'm going to go to seminary and let me back up in the story slightly. Cause I, I think it, there's a good lesson that you taught me at that point. Uh, Mark, I'm going to go to seminary. I want to preach. And 
because my growth was still early, you're like, mm, not yet. Jonathan called ministries internal and external, internal, your desires, external with, with the Lord or the church would affirm yeah. in your calling, competence, character. Let us watch you for a while. Okay. That seems reasonable. So that's, I, th- I think it was after that. Then I did mm-hmm. the, 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 the deacon of member care. I went to you a second time, Mark, I got to go to seminary. And you said, mm, do the internship first. Okay, that seems reasonable. And this was back in the days before your formal internship. Yeah, and so I like I like to tell the interns that you have who I think read what, 20, 25 books? Uh, more than that, but yeah. I, say that, I often say Much that, of it written by Jonathan Lehman. <laughs> I, I say, tell, uh, guess how many books I read? And the answer was like two. It was the Murray yeah. book and the... Um, Charles, Bridges, Charles Bridges. Christian minister. So it was an early form yeah. of the internship. Yeah. And it was just hanging out with you. Yeah. Though you were gone for the first month, you were somewhere. And so I ended up preaching at the church up in Northwest. Yeah. Wisconsin Avenue. Wisconsin Avenue. Yeah. So my first month of the internship was just preparing getting sermons. Getting to know Papu Sandu. In, in First Peter. That's right. Getting yeah. to know Papu. Yeah. And then hanging out with you September to December. Then went to seminary in, in January 2001. of one. So pulling the camera back on that 96 to 2000 time here. Basic significance of those early DC years in your life and thought? I got saved and called. And then everything, all of that would represent. Did your thinking change much? Yeah, well, there would be several crucial, I don't know, change or crystallizing of certain things that were latent or what. One of the big ones was authority. Hmm. And my thinking around authority crystallizing, developing in a way that I realized this is a big deal. This is something we need to get right. Mm. And where you did a great job of both exercising and talking about the goodness of good authority, but also you've always been consistent, brother, in talking about the badness of bad authority. Mm. You've done both. And I don't hear a lot of people doing both. Mm. And so I think I had strong ideas of both of those. And I remember getting, I remember in the internship, thinking about all the Lord had done in my life, looking back and thought, authority and submitting to it was a huge part of this. Mm. Evangelicals don't understand this. No, Somebody and, should talk about this. And just personally watching you and how you responded to authority, there was a marked change. I would say early on in your time here, you did not respond well to authority. No, not so and much. And you were not enjoyable to have around. Not so much. And at some point, there was a big change. It was like there was just a whole different character. And you were just a sweet servant. And it was just, it was remarkable. Well, that's God's grace in my life. And, and the way, the way I tell the story, and you've, you've heard me say this, Mark, it was, there was a few moments in there where there was kind of a rich young rulers sell everything and follow me. But for me, it wasn't sell everything. I didn't have a lot to sell. It was submit Mm. to these, to this pastor, to these elder brothers Mm. and follow me. That was my Mm. test. And and the Lord in his grace used that through Uh, the spirit. Much more we talk about here, but we got to move on. Camera goes to Louisville. You're in Louisville from 2001 to 2004 at the Southern Baptist Seminary doing another master's degree. Mm -hmm. So you already had a master's in political theory. Mm -hmm. Now you're doing a master's in divinity. Mm -hmm. How are those years? Wonderful. Sweet. Two reasons. Well, three reasons. Uh, Number one, I would meet Shannon. Mm -hmm. So who's now my wife? She was out there. Number two, Clifton Baptist. Yeah. What a sweet time. Yeah. Old moderate church mm-hmm. joined it because near Southern seminary. That's right. Yeah. One month or one semester prior, John and Carrie Page Fulmer, two. John and Carrie Fulmer had joined. Uh, we had a deacon who didn't believe in the resurrection. Mm. We had a bunch of people who were sweet, but you know, I don't know what they believed or not. And we had an interim pastor who had been trained in the Southern Seminary in the 50s and believed in kind of the double speak. You say one thing, though, you know, you meet yeah. another thing. But John and Carrie and I uh, uh, were all part of that and got involved and started teaching and, you know, fast forward, church revitalization, merger, Tom Schreiner becomes pastor. Great time. Merger. Trinity Baptist? Trinity Baptist. Tell, tell us briefly, what was Trinity Baptist? It was, D- a young, it, was, was there. it was a young seminarian heavy yeah. church yeah. led by seminarian profs. Bruce Ware, meeting, Tom Schreiner. Sean Wright. Sean Wright. Meeting in an elementary school and they had a lot of money and they had no building and they had a lot of good theology. Mm-hmm. Merging and they had with, Deepak Reju. And Deepak Reju. And uh, decided, to, well, it, it's a longer story, maybe another interview, but 
we, we had a series of uh, uh, attempts to uh, hire various pastors, and I won't get into it. Clifton did. Clifton did. And anyway, long story short, the two merged. The two merged, and and and, and, and honestly, behind the scenes, because I just know from being back here at Washington, I'm getting phone calls from John oh, sure. and from you and I'm from sure. Deepak and Trinity and Sean Wright. I'm sure. So I'm I'm kind of watching <laughs> the docking of of the ship. Watching slash uh, moving things from behind uh, the ship. No, no, I, I merely listen. No, no, uh, I merely okay, listen. Okay, okay. So how how was that merger? I remember sitting down, and it's sort of embarrassing to think about the fact yeah. that I did this now. Yeah. So here, here's me revealing yeah. my shame. I sat down with Tom Schreiner. and exhort- Who was that? The one that was coming That's in? Trinity. And said, look, Tom. You had are- the building. He had the people. These are sweet old people. You guys need to be nice to them. Yeah. Uh, if you knew Tom, yeah, if you knew that's, Tom, that's, that's ridiculous. Thing to say to Tom, in the world especially for Jonathan Lehman to say to Tom, <laughs> <laughs> <It's> <laughs> really okay, exactly, all right, all exactly. Right. And I'm just like, they just that's like me going up to Mike Conroy and saying, "Lose weight." I mean, <laughs> really? Okay, go ahead. Uh, s- because John and Carrie and I had developed an affection for these people and knew them to be kind, sweet people, yeah. just deeply unformed theologically and a yeah. little scared of yeah. New Southern Seminary and, and all of its doctrine. And what a good relationship the Lord gave you with John Fulmer during that time. Oh, no, that was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. He and I lived together briefly for a couple of weeks before we got married. So uh-huh. I knew him from here in yeah. D.C., but then, yes, yeah, so and then we had that time together. And then the merger, tr- and, and, and Trinity, young Trinity, young seminary, heady Trinity came in and couldn't have been more godly and humble. Mm. They were gracious. They got mm. to know the old people. They mm. invited them over. It was a sweet merger. So other than discipling Tom Schreiner in kindness, what, what, <laughs> what was your role in that merger? Oh, I don't... Uh, I think I was more cheerleader. I don't know that I had any formal official. Well, role. okay. That once the church is merged and Clifton is now, you kept the name Clifton. Yeah, that's right. So the Trinity guys just gave up their name. They all just kind of joined. Well, interestingly, Clifton. The, the part of the negotiations was, was hey, we'll keep Trinity's um, Clifton's constitution for the first year, and then after a year of this, then we'll kind of renegotiate all of these things. Was that a wise way to go or not? In general, I don't know, but it worked out in this situation. And so I continue to try to be an example of what um, loving the old people would look like. So I, I, and I would, you know, teach, ended up teaching a Sunday school with Bruce Ware. He and I co-taught a, a, a Sunday school together in, in the remainder of those years and would occasionally preach and so forth. Just in summary, because, you know, we're only like in what, 2004, five, somewhere in there. We, we got to, we only have so much time. Two, three, four. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what would you summarize that you feel you learned from your time at Clifton there? Well, the great not thing, just the merger, but living in that church, be a part of it. You could have a healthy church that adhere to the same principles as Capitol Hill Baptist and the things talked about, discussed by Nine Marks, and it can look and feel different, mm-hmm. Very a different, different. culture. Yeah. And honestly, so for instance, uh, I'd had my father as a good role model, mm-hmm. and I had you as a good role model. And especially because I've been in your church for four years, in some ways, I, pretty I, formative years. Yeah, they're very yeah. formative years, and you know, I would say the Lord saved me in those years. You know, you, kind of your example of manliness and godliness loomed large. But then I remember being with Tom Schreiner, mm-hmm. and Bruce Ware, mm-hmm. and and Sean Wright, and other brothers, mm-hmm. and the Lord afforded me other examples yeah. of godliness, really good examples, beautiful examples. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, and, and so in the same way you, with those men, I would say the churches. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You know, when interns leave here, for instance, and they go pastor or plant or do whatever they yeah. revitalize, it doesn't have to look just like Capital Baptist. You can yeah. you can say, pursue these same principles, but in different yeah. clothing. Yeah. So um, you've had a couple of experiences pastoring churches as the main preacher. A lot of people may not realize that these days mm-hmm. because that's in, in the past. Tell us briefly about your time at First Baptist Church Grand Cayman, but because before Thabiti Anyabwile was there, you were the pastor. Yes, uh, it was a... A lot of people don't know that these days. <clears throat> it, was, it was a lot of fun. It was What a beautiful amazing. place. It, it's a beautiful place. How the, sweet is Shane... The church building How is sweet beautiful. is Shane Foster? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. And his brother Dax. I yeah. enjoyed both of those brothers yeah. and, their, and their families. Um, it was a last-minute decision. I mm-hmm. won't get into the details. And suddenly I find myself... Pastoring a into church. This four or 500-member church. In, in an idyllic location. But a vibrant church of of, of yeah. highly internationally I mean, I think so, Steve Brady, who's there now, had been there before. Steve's a faithful evangelical okay. preacher. Yeah. And they wanted to grow in good directions, but they hadn't had expositional preaching. Hmm. The that guy who was right before me didn't do that. Okay. He was a topical preacher. From America. Yeah. And, that's right. And I remember 
they said, when I got there, they said, hey, Jonathan, the elders, the few brothers said, we really want you to do 40 days of purpose as your kind of first thing. And I'm like, that uh, was a popular book at the time by Rick Warren. That's right. Yeah. 40 days of purpose, a program from the book, Purpose Driven Church. And I'm like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. And a interim pastor has a certain freedom to, you know. Oh, so you were just an interim pastor. Yes, I was. Okay. And I had a certain freedom to be like, I don't want to do that. And uh, I'm just going to preach Mark's gospel. So I started preaching through Mark's gospel. They liked it. By God's grace. Yeah, they, they really yeah, did enjoy I it. This. And I remember things changing in the life of the church mm. around God's word. What That's I'd so experienced cool. at Capitol Hill was beginning to happen in Grand Cayman. Yeah. And that was that was beautiful. Yeah. And I developed a sweet relationship with the, the elders. And they they asked me to stay on, to become the yeah. the full time. Yeah. And I entered a, a period of, of uncertainty and doubt, like, should I, should I do this? Should I not? And I yeah. went back and forth. And it was interesting. I don't think she'd mind my telling the story. My wife was like, I don't really, this has been lovely, but I don't know well, that I want to live on a little island the rest of, my, rest of my life. It's very hard for people with, from the mainland with, with to move no to seasons. an island. I hear that all the no time. No seasons. Yeah. And I'm like, ah, oh, I just love this, babe. I really think I might want to do this, but I'm not sure. And she's like, ah, oh, I don't know. And the we church and loved forth. you from what I could tell. And eventually she said, uh, you know what? If the Lord is calling us here, I trust you. I, you know, I don't know. She said, I submit, but yeah, she yeah. was like, she, she, she effectively was submitting. She, yeah. she submitted. And her doing that actually freed me to, in a way, count the cost mm. a little bit more honestly with myself. And uh -huh. when she did that, instead of feeling like I was pulling against her, yeah. I thought, I really want to do a PhD. Okay. I really feel like the Lord has created me to run faster, but I need the training. Mm. I'm not even sure I want to be a professor per se, but I just, I need more training. And so I declined that opportunity and then went back to, to Louisville. Louisville. But the thing is, you didn't go back to Clifton because people also didn't realize not only were you the pastor of First Baptist Grand came in before Thabiti, you were the pastor of Third Avenue Baptist in Louisville before Greg Gilbert. Yeah, that's right. How'd that happen? Well, uh, a brother called me and said, I hear you're coming back to Louisville. How about when you do your PhD there, you also work as a pastor of this church? And so I did. Third Avenue was smaller Third then Avenue than it is much now. Much smaller, a uh, very different situation. But the elders were brothers I loved and who I knew. Uh, they'd kind of come in and establish themselves as elders or were established as elders. And so I started doing that. And the experience was both wonderful and not wonderful in that I enjoyed the pastoring work. I enjoyed doing it. Uh, just started the PhD at Southern. What didn't go well was my preaching. And this is funny because you're a pretty good preacher. I, I would just say. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think the, 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 the uh, basically I wanted to be a good preacher and I wanted to be seen as a good preacher. And so every sit week I would sit down with the text. I started in the Psalms, did a few Psalms, and then I did Colossians. I would look to the text and say, okay, what's what's a new angle I can come at this text with? Hmm. Because there was a number of seminarians in the church, and I wanted to say things that would really captivate them, hmm. right? Something was interesting. And again, I at that point, I had a little bit of a reputation of being a good preacher coming from Grand Cayman and how things went there. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, I, I really got to gotta dazzle them. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be just another, you know, mm -hmm. ordinary whatever. So there was a lot of pride there, mm -hmm. arrogance, fear of man, all conspiring to affect my preaching such that mm. I would distort the text. I would preach what I wanted to preach out of the text rather than just the text, right? And it's funny because throughout that semester, my wife was like, something was off in your preaching. I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't understand the kind of the cool things I'm doing here. And I didn't say it quite like that, yeah. but that posh that attitude was in my heart mm. but she she intuited it because my my wife is just a wonderful faithful bible mm. reader and we got to the end of that time and the brother said jonathan we don't think you're the guy to be the pastor of this church mm. why well you know you're doing a great job getting to know people and loving the people and counseling you, you know five stars over there but you're preaching it's 20 to 30 degrees off the point of the text every week we just mm. don't think we're to build this congregation on that kind of preaching mm. and that that shocked embarrassed uh, mortified me. Mm. What do you mean? That, 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 that's, that's what I do. I, I am this. Mm. Uh, and they said, but we love you. And so we want to, we, we gave further thought about why is this happening? What's going on? And here's the deal, Jonathan, you're creative. And we're concerned that that creative impulse is going to continue potentially to distort your pre preaching. 
and uh, they didn't make guesses about my heart. But when they said all of that, at that moment, kind of a, a bell was just like, I knew exactly what they were talking about. And it was like at that moment, my eyes opened and I could look back over the previous few weeks, months and see everything I just told you a moment ago Mm -hmm. about what my heart was wanting to do. And I'm like, of course they're right. Mm. They're a hundred percent right. I've been vain. Mm. I've been ambitious in a worldly sense and that's distorting my preaching. Mm. And so the Lord used that uh, occasion gloriously to sear the lesson into my conscience. Number one, fear God, not man. Number two, just preach the point of the text, Mm -hmm. which eventually became a book reverberation mm-hmm. not work with so church. a couple of times uh, you've you've mentioned shannon uh, we should if we're trying to get your life here can which, we just have a little apparently bit apparently we're doing can we just have a little bit more about shannon i mean you met her the first time at southern a fellow californian yeah well she grew up in atlanta Ohio. but, but no, her, atlanta. her no her okay. folks moved to california and so all of her interactions with her folks now are yes in california uh shannon was at boyce college she and i were at clifton baptist together that's where i got to know her a little bit because i was student life coordinator at boyce college and i taught some classes i didn't teach her classes though and uh so got to know her through that what struck me our our courting brief story from courting i spent a month in uzbekistan with the clients Mm. and she and i had just sort of struck up conversations prior to that i went to uzbekistan this is the back in the days of uh, internet cafes. Mm-hmm. I remember walking down Samarkand, Uzbekistan, trying to find the, the internet cafes to, to email this girl. Yeah. Right. And what struck me about her emails is they were, A, they were long. B, they were all about the girls she was discipling mm. in the church. Oh, that's so good. Or women she was evangelizing because yeah. she was a, a server at California Pizza Kitchen there at the mall in Louisville. Where I might go to lunch later today. But anyway. And... Um, uh, I just thought, oh my gosh, this this is a pastor's wife because mm. it's all about discipling younger Christian girls and all about evangelizing her CPK, you know, fellow servers. Yeah, and I would say it was in it was it was in those emails. I just I, I went from a I'm attracted to this. I knew I was attracted to this girl when I when I left town, but it was it was those emails that made me think, I think I want to marry this girl. Mm. Uh, based on what I saw in those emails. And uh, that's what I would say she is like and mm. will continue to this Well, day. and the Lord in his providence has, have, has, has given you four daughters. That's right. Emma, now 17? Emma, seven, uh, yeah, 17. Hannah, 16. Yep. Madeline, 14. 14. Sophie, Sophie, 10. A few days away from 10. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what a wonderful, amazing, glorious gift. They are all to me. Mm. I love teenagers. Mm. Teenage girls are a hoot. Mm. If you just be friends with them, mm-hmm. I don't want to say it's that simple, but part of me wants to say it's almost just be mm-hmm. friends with them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so we have, we have lots of fun together. You moved back to DC. You began the job you've held for almost 20 years now. I know. You're the <laughs> editor at nine marks. Been here for a while, Mark. How has that job grown and shaped you over the years? I don't know. I mean, I trust, I don't know if I have anything. And you started that job in what, 2006? No, mm-hmm. no, 2006. 2006. Well, I did I did a year of stuff for you before that. Working on the Messy Old Testament, New right. Testament. But then this this present job in its present form. I uh, so uh, 17 June, years June, now. June, June of 06. And um, how has it grown me? Well, it's certainly grown my love and conviction for this church. I, I feel like a salesman who believes deeply and profoundly in what he's trying to sell. Well, rather six years ago, you helped lead a church plant out of here. Yeah, that's right. That was so in that 2017. Was, oh, man, was, you uh, kind of did it. Uh huh. Well, me and the other brothers. Right. But I mean, you put into practice of many of the things you've yeah. been writing about. And, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I, 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 you know, I'd like to, certainly my, my love for the church has grown through those years. Uh, I hope my love for the Lord has grown, uh, the Lord of the church and, and those years. Um, you, you, you've edited countless journals. Mm-hmm. Worthwhile way to have spent a lot of time? I hope so. The Lord will reveal that in heaven. Yeah, I think so. You've done hundreds of podcasts like this. Mm-hmm. So U- useful to do? <laughs> Surprisingly. My work ethic, Mark, d- derives from a comment you made in many respects years ago. You like to put your head down. And then every once in a while, you you look up and you look around. And you're like, oh wow, look what's been done. And you put your head back down. 
And I think that's very much been my work ethic. Let's just put our head down. Let's get to it. Let's not worry about the fanfare. And it, it finally is going to be the Lord to reveal on the last day whether or not these things that we're doing have, have built hay or straw that has burned up or, or gold and silver that lasts. He, he will reveal that. I, I feel that profoundly. You've spoken I, at scores of schools and conferences in the U.S. around the world. Anything stick out? Deep gratitude for the opportunity to do that. When I look back and think on who I was, what I was like in college. Okay, if you ask me top regrets in my life, one of them was who I was at the University of Rochester. Mm. Top three, easily. Mm. Who I was at the University of Rochester. And the shame I brought in Christ's name mm. and the way I hurt people. Just deep regret. Mm. I trust it's all covered in the blood of Christ. Mm-hmm. I believe that profoundly. And at the same time, there is grief in my heart Mm. over who I was and what I was like in those years. And the fact that the Lord would use that guy to help others think about the church and loving others in the church is a, it's almost like a divine practical joke played on Mm. the forces of hell. I know the feeling, yeah. And the, I get to I get to revel in that and Amen. be the recipient of that grace is astonishing to me. And so with every journal, with every book, with every podcast, it's like wow, more gravy mm-hmm. of grace and goodness. Amen. As somebody who's watched everything you've done, it, it seems to me one of the things you talked about most was the first time you went and taught in Africa, and the questions you got from the students. Yeah, that seemed to be used by the Lord to. Help your thinking. Referring to the sameness of everybody everywhere? Um, yeah, and yes, most fundamentally, but also the variety that comes out in Surprising Offense. I, I think... Uh, I well, okay, th- when I talk about contextualizing, uh, I, I make two points. One, be sensitive to differences and be suspicious. Hmm. We're not that different. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, anecdote for each. Be suspicious of how different we are. I remember a young man in, in, in South Africa raising his hand and saying, you know, I, I worry about what people and members of my church think of me. And he was, he was a member of the Kosa tribe. And I remember thinking, okay, you are as far you away. You can't from say me. that with the click. Uh, you know, I, sometimes I do, but I no Kosa. Okay. Um, was that terrible? Yeah. Better than uh, I could do. I mean, when he asked that question, I thought, you're just like every guy I know back in the States. Mm-hmm. We're not that different. We're all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, you know, different radio station, but it's all the same song. You know, mm-hmm. you, you, you fear your ancestors. You fear the stock market. You fear whether or not your goat's going to give enough milk. You, you fear whether or not, the, you know, your boss at work like it. We're all the same, yeah. even if it's a slightly different variation. And so all this talk about contextualization can really cloud that. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think Mark 9 Marks has a message. And so far as we're saying, hey, the Bible says this, this, this is crucial for your church no matter where you are. Okay, so there's that whole side of things. Mm-hmm. The be suspicious of our differences side. Yeah. The be sensitive side of things is, no, you need to pay attention to, uh, you know, okay, so the, 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 the month I spent in Uzbekistan uh-huh. in a kind of house church situation was was. V- no building, no full-time pastor, yeah. no formal statement of faith. Uh, it was a series of, of verses that they memorized as part of, no written down membership list, hmm. but the 20 people who were members, they all knew who they were. Yeah, and they knew who each other were. And they knew who yeah. each other were, yeah. and they they exercised discipline. Yeah. But they didn't want that list to get into the hands of the local Muslim clerics, Yeah, you know, for safety's sake. Yeah. Okay, same principles at play, but in a contextualized, sensitive, culturally sensitive way. You've edited an amazing number of books. Well, at least least say a considerable number of books. Mm -hmm. Would you say your experience as an editor uh, is more steady and focused than most editors who've done that for a job? I have no idea. Uh, what, what are you getting at? Do, do you, are there many people who spend 20 years as an editor? Oh, I think if you go to book publishers, I, I assume they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're brothers who I've worked. You know, I think, say, Justin Taylor uh-huh. at Crossway. You know, okay. he's, he's been there as long as I've been here. And so the work he's done is, is and, and I, I could name or think of a few other you yeah. know, individuals like that. So I, I think, now, if you go to a you know, local magazine or newspaper or what used to be called newspapers, yeah, there's a little bit more change and turnover. Now, in our remaining time, 
You got to keep that in mind, my loquacious friend. <laughs> and my remaining. As I've been saying, I think I'm doing pretty good on a job being a succinct. Is you that are. Not? You uh, often you are. Often. Uh, in our and when you're not, often. it's it's entertaining and oh, interesting yeah, 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 and edifying. Yeah, compelling. Uh, in our remaining time, in all these books you've edited. Uh, you, you did a lot in the early 2000s. Any particularly significant ones as you look back? Like, it's, I'm really glad I did that one. Uh, let me name three for three different reasons. Uh, Word Center Church. Is that known as, well, that's different. You wrote that one. Oh, I'm you I'm talking mean, just editing. Your editing work. Because people know more your written work. What people never see is your editing work. And so much of your time has been editing. I mean, I could tell stories about a lot of the books. Uh, well, I, I remember yeah. working on how to build a healthy church. Uh, 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 Deliberate church. What, no, what is a healthy church? What is a healthy church, yeah. You know, the book you yeah. did. Yeah. Well, and, which you wrote the most popular part of that, Mr. Nose, Mr. Eye, Mr. Hand. That, was, that, that's Jonathan Lehman. Everybody. It was It was. It was. fun working on that with you. Uh, Michael Lawrence, uh, his book Conversion is a fantastic book, and I think I was able to help shape it. Mm. And, 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 and I don't think he'd mind my saying this. He thought about the doctrine of conversion, his repentance and faith, God's sovereignty, our responsibility. And I said, Michael, let's let's make this corporate. Hmm. Let's make That's what you tried to do, that whole building of the whole church series. series. And so Michael being humble and receiving my 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 counsel uh allowed me to kind of push him and writing it in a, a more corporate direction. Mm-hmm. So it, when I think about opportunities like that, that's yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. You know? Well, in that series, particularly, I think of Max Stiles' book on evangelism or John Onwichek's book on prayer, mm-hmm. both so wonderfully kind of corporately. So what do you enjoy about the craft of editing? I'm not asking you about you as an author. Yeah. I'm asking about the craft of editing. Number one, it, f- it does force a kind of humility. For a, Because a, you're not the author. Because you're not the author. And there are kind of parameters you have to work with. You have to stay behind the curtain. Yeah, yeah. And even if... You have to stay behind the curtain and you have to find it in their voice. Uh-huh. So there's a good spiritual discipline exercise in all of that. Yeah, of, I can of, see that. Of, of, of forcing, I'm going to put myself in their shoes, find their voice. I, I get no glory from this. I'm yeah. trying to make them better on their terms. And there's a sense in which in a pastor, you're doing something similar. Mm-hmm. You're looking at the With congregation the and you're asking yourself, how can every person, I remember you once saying, you know, you think of the church like members of an orchestra. How can mm-hmm. I get that trumpet player, that violin, yeah. and that, that timpani player to be the best version of themselves? The conductor is the most important and the least important yeah, person exa- there. Exactly. And yeah. in the same way, the editor is like, how can I make you help you be the yeah. best version of yourself yeah. that you can be? Yeah. And so it, it requires a, a bit of, of back and forth conversation, humility but pushiness yeah. you're like mm, you can say that better in 2010 crossway published your first book the church and the surprising offense of god's love i re- remember a set of interns once gave me a new version of that which they retitled it the church and the surprising link surprisingly offensive length of this book of this book mm-hmm. what was it about you and Matt Schmucker uh, asked me to write a book on church membership and discipline. And then you said, Man, you know, why don't you send it around the theme of love? Because you had done that. Talk at Southwestern. Talk at Southwestern. And so that sent me on a long journey of reading a whole bunch of books on love hmm. and also membership and discipline hmm. and trying to figure out and basically saying, listen, our culture keeps you from understanding what love is because love is all about self-expression, self-discovery, self-realization. I love you by letting you do that. And that works against a doctrine of the church and the authority of the church and membership and discipline in the church. So it's about love and then it's about those topics. It's love misdefined, redefined, and lived. There we go. That was the clever way you did that. Then in 2011, Moody publishes your book, Reverberation. The word, the sermon, reverberation. Which grew out of the experience at at, at, um, Third Avenue. Hmm. And that experience of not being hired and then aka fired as the full-time pastor and the lord using that in my life to give me a do you deep, tell that story in this book i do mm. a deep conviction over the power of is the most important thing you do as a preacher most important thing you do as a pastor is plainly reveal the text to god's people because it's god's wisdom that gives life not ours mm. and god's works through his word and what one other let me just say one other thing about this uh, you know, as, as the evangelicals responding to enlightenment, scientific naturalism and so forth, we often talk about the doctrine of scripture according to its attributes. It's mm-hmm. inerrant, it's authoritative, mm-hmm. it's clear, perspicuous and so forth. But what we don't do as much is talk about what 
the word of God does, it's power. And so that's what I, I try to do in this. But God acts through his word. God changes and creates through his word. So not only does it have those attributes, it actually does something. Mm-hmm. And so that's what the focus of that book is. And then played out through the life of the congregation. In 2012, what sprang from your fruitful brain, among other things, was the Building Healthy Church series. Yep. And you not only edited all of those books, but you wrote two of the first ones, mm-hmm. Church Membership in the Blue, eight short practical chapters, and Church Discipline in the Red, your first book, by the way, with no dedication. It's... Who do you want to dedicate a book on church discipline to? Establishing a framework, (laughs) applying the framework, case studies, and getting started. Yeah, that's right. These two books have been amazingly useful. These two books have probably been among the most popularly useful things you've done. Well, uh, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you agree? I, 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 I wouldn't say I've sold any of my books. I've sold a ton, but of my books, that church membership is the best seller. Yeah, Blue Lightning, as one pastor in Kentucky called it, something like that. Yeah, so. Comments on those? Um, Both uh, simple, direct, straightforward. If yeah. you want to begin thinking about this topic, yeah. you're pleased with how the they topic. worked. Yeah, well, I'm very pleased. Yeah. I mean, if I were to write them now, I might be to do a few things a little different, but I agree with everything I said in the book. And I and that whole series of the sort of different colored little, little size books has been... My goal in that series was to find authors who had some competence slash expertise in that topic, like, yeah, like David Helm on expositional preaching. Matt Merker on corporate worship. Merker on that. Max Stiles on evangelism yeah. and so forth. And uh, I think it's worked out. And to give a very corporate angle to all of these topics, like with conversion, as I said yeah. before. Yeah. And I think it's worked out. 2014 saw you with a third publisher. You were branching out B&H as you edited the volume of 2012 T4G addresses. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, that was just me putting those together and enjoying working with them. Uh, and each of the authors was gracious and easy to work with. And it was a um, edifying experience for me. I was always a skeptic of those edited volumes. I don't volumes, know if they sold me. Yeah, anyway. 2015, again with B&H, you and I co-edited a book, whatever that means, uh, that you also contributed three significant chapters to. Man, that, that was a lot of work. Well, brother, you're, uh, the editing Not was the, the, probably the, work, more work for you than I mean. for me. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but you had three chapters, Why Polity, mm-hmm. which honestly, our interns still read, and mm-hmm. they're going to be discussing tomorrow morning. Mm-hmm. I'm reading their papers on them right now. Before this interview started, when it's done, I'll go back to reading their papers on, on that. Nobody cares or thinks about, okay, go back to the late 90s, and I yeah. said I'm going off to seminary, and I'm yeah. thinking about my experience. I'm like, oh, evangelicals don't get authority. Yeah. Well, what is polity? It's all about authority. What's yeah. the significance of polity? Again, evangelicals don't talk about that. Yeah. And what our work, Mark, has been about is in many ways is, you know, uh, revitalizing the topic of polity. I had a super interesting conversation with Bart Barber the other day, uh-huh. and Bart was saying he often summarizes sort of history of Southern Baptists in a 19th century sort of ontological ecclesiology, what the church is, 20th century more sort of practical teleological ecclesiology, what the church does. Uh-huh. And he says now it's more sort of nine marks, therapeutic ecclesiology, not therapeutic, it's a therapeutic deism, but health. Okay. In, in a... Ah. a, a how a church is structured. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he thought nine marks had played a role in that. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah. The two chapters at the end were the church and church as a congregational approach to unity, holiness, apostolicity, faith yep. and order, and then a congregational approach to Catholicity, independence and interdependence. I thought it'd be useful to go back on the original kind of, you know, uh, marks of the church and and consider them from a congregational perspective. And especially the chapter on Catholicity was useful for me to begin thinking about that topic, which we don't give much attention to in general, yeah. we evangelicals. But also work from what I'd seen happen at Capitol Hill Baptist and its emphasis on partnering with other churches. And we're about to release a journal on Catholicity, and the subtitle is partnering, uh, churches partnering together. Hmm. What's What's the, you know... The, the bottom line of Catholicity. Recognizing the authority of the Bishop of Rome. You should exactly no. Okay. You should, however, but but that impulse to like no, we don't recognize that authority yeah. does not mean you should not be working with other churches and seeing God's work in fulfilling the Great Commission in your partnership with other churches. By the way, we left something untied up. You moved to Louisville to do a PhD, and yet we've heard nothing more about a PhD. And when I look in the back of a book or someplace. I found out that you, I find that you have a PhD from the University of Wales. Yeah. How were your years in Wales? Uh, 
I spent three days in Wales, most of the PhD for defending my dissertation. Okay. I ended up after a semester at Southern Matt and the, the third Avenue job didn't work yeah. out. Matt Schmucker calls me. He's like, how about you be editorial director of nine marks yeah. around the same time? Michael Haken strangely uh, says, Hey, I know this program for PhDs through Wales. Do and this distance. is when non-residential programs were more rare. Yeah, very rare. They're very common these it was, days. It was a brand new thing. Yeah, it was That's rare right. then. And uh, I thought, hmm, I could go back and work for Nine Marks as editorial director and work on this PhD at the University of Wales, just transfer programs. And after a semester of coursework at Southern, I was tired of coursework and I was ready to write. Understood. I knew what I wanted to write on. Yeah. I was ready to write. And the Lord used a lot of the work that I was doing with Church of the Surprising Offense and the membership and discipline books to form me in some ways and teach me while also working on my dissertation, political church. Hmm. So there was a, there was a mutual feeding back hmm. and forth that those, hmm. you know, my day job and my evening weekend job yeah. afforded me. Well, as Paul Harvey used to say, page three. So how was the, that was a successful, it, it worked exactly like you would want it to work. It did. It was some of the hardest in, in terms of schedule demanding years of my life. My mm -hmm. wife and I mapped out every 30 minutes of my week, you know, beginning at like at 5.30 a.m. until 12.30, 1 a.m. Mm. And every night, every day, I, I try to keep my 30-minute increments of, again, writing books in the day for nine marks and editing the journals mm -hmm. while also then researching and writing political church at night. So and, 2016 was a kind of high tide for your publishing. You published books with two different publishers. 2016, you published with University Press, mm -hmm. your book, Political Church, the Local Assembly as Embassy of Christ Rule. Stanley Hauerwas even endorsed this book. Well, you know, uh, the one endorsement that's missing is yours. It's because I've never read all of it. Well, do you recall what you said after Licking reading concrete. <laughs> asphalt. Asphalt. Licking, even yeah. better than concrete. Yeah. It's yeah. like, Jonathan, it's sort of like licking asphalt. Well, I, I think it's a, it's a fair and true thing to say. I have read many pages in this book. <laughs> okay. I have read many pages in this book. Many means like more than three. Four. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm serious. I probably read 50 to 70 pages okay. in here in right. various parts of it, kind of trying to understand. Yeah. So that was, I remember after I finished my, my PhD and defended it and they said, hey, you get it. I walked up to you in, in, at the, in the church building one, one Sunday. And you said, congratulations, you're done. You know, in terms of moments in life when you feel most free, there is conversion and then finishing your PhD. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's... Because when you're in your PhD, any amount of time you give to it would seem to shorten the amount of time it will take. Oh, and goodness. so it is an incredibly demanding. Oh, it is, yeah. yeah. Um, in this, you argue about the nature of politics and institutions. Yeah, yeah. Just, can you explain that briefly? Again, it's drawing out all those lessons around authority and the goodness of authority. And the subtitle to this Baptist Foundations book, Church Government in an Anti-Institutional Age, that word anti-institutional. We don't like institutions. We like spirituality. That book, uh, Tara Burton, Isabella, mm, Tara Isabella Barton, Burton, Strange Right, Burton. she argues we're not in an institutional age, we're in an intuitional age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's another way of getting at similar yeah. ideas. And... So in that book, I tap into a lane of thinking that's going on in political science departments called kind of neo-institutional research and writing in which more and more political scientists, interestingly, are discovering the power and the importance of institutions. Tim Keller like talking about this. Okay. And uh, so I'm, I'm tapping into similar things there through my own experience of membership and discipline and writing on these things, uh -huh. right? And finding the significance that, of that for what a church is. So, yeah, the church does that, but it also, the, the book does that, but the book also has, back to the earlier part of the conversation, has a conversation with philosophical liberalism, classical liberalism. And what does that mean? And, and ultimately what I do in that is is write a kind of political theology from the ground up. Well, you, you work it through biblical theology, basically. You go from creation, fall, new covenant, and then kingdom. So one of the, the biblical engine... The biblical systematic engine in that book is what I'd learned from Steve Wallum and Peter Gentry in their works on uh, Kingdom Through Covenant. So, yeah, mm. it's functioning underneath it all, and yeah. I'm doing a lot of the political ramifications, uh -huh. implications, and ecclesial. And have either Peter or Steve that. read this? Steve read it as I was writing it. Yeah. What did he and think? He gave me, oh, yeah, he was, he was very encouraging and gave me good feedback as I went. Uh -huh. 
That's good you found more faithful brothers. And then in 2016, you also published uh, a number of books with B&H. Three you wrote, others you edited. Um, B&H, Don't Fire Your Church Members, The Case for Congregationalism. Th- uh, seven fairly thick chapters. Yeah. How's this book done? I don't know how it's done. I've, I've received an anecdotal, encouraging anecdotal feedback from friends who have read it and benefited from it. It's the done classic modern defense of congregationalism, it which is, I don't think you would, I know the subtitle is the case for congregationalism, but I don't think you'd know that from this kind of cover. It's a bad cover and a bad title. It makes you think it's a popularly written book and it's not. It's yeah, more there's no heavily drawings, footnoted. You know, there's no balloon footnoted. dial dialogue right. balloons. I mean, it is like, it's it's like almost this one's little sister. No, I mean, that's exactly like, right. You know, and yeah. it, but that was my attempt to do an academic defense of yeah. congregation, well, elder led congregation. Thank you for it. So, Have there been serious like Anglican or Presbyterian or Lutheran reviews of it that you know of? I don't know. That'd be interesting. I know. If anybody's watching this and knows of one, let us know. Yeah. Uh, in terms of what it accomplished, it helped fill out what I think, and I was then able to write a much shorter version, yeah. popular version of that. Well, B and H did that uh, church basic series, the six little books you edited. Two mm-hmm. of them were written by you, understanding church discipline, and understanding the congregation's authority. Yeah, understanding congregation's authority is the lighter, easier, much quicker version of this. Which is funny because this has this very sober cover. We're like, you know, who's going to pick this up and read it? Yeah, you know, but this one, this one looks. You're going to give it to your teenager, you know. Well, you know what's funny? I'll just can I just say this in terms of books of mine that don't get noticed and got have gotten lost, uh-huh. but I think are important. Yeah, like if I contribute anything in some ways, I hope I yeah. contribute some of the material of this book. Yeah, brother, it's John and, Cotton Keys to the Kingdom for this generation. That's right, and so. Yeah, then popularized in that version. Understanding yeah. church discipline is because B and H said, "Well, we need in this series we need a little book on discipline." I'm like, "I already have a book on discipline." They're like, "Well, we want one in this series," and so I yeah. wrote that little one. Yeah, um, I aim this more at a member, though. So, is this series because there are two more by me and two more by Great Commission and Leadership? Yeah, and, and two then more Bobby by... on Baptism and the Supper. Yeah, and I think is it's a good little series. Yeah, I, you know, it's been translated a number of times. Uh, I think it was translated to Arabic a couple of years ago, and. Yeah, so honestly, I, this is a great little starter kit for yeah. all, a lot of the things we talk about, at least around church polity yeah. and governance and, yeah. and and the ordinances. So I, I wish this book got a little bit more. Yeah. These books got yeah. a little bit more recognition. Well, I think, I, th- they're helpful. I, I think there are a lot of people who have hung in here an hour and a half in this conversation, and they can go out and really pump this series there again. We go uh, church basics B and H. Buy yeah. some for your Sunday school class, uh, and then you did also in 2016. Uh, the T4G address is unashamed of the gospel. And I think that was the last of the ones we did, didn't, aren't they? I, uh, you guys yeah. had done three or four or five of them, and I think yeah. that may be the last. I was never, yeah. Yep. Uh, and then in 2017, Moody reissued Reverberation as Word Center Church. Yep. Any big change? Mm, I'd say it's 90% the same. Why the reissue? In the 2011, when Reverberation was published, one name books were popular. Uh huh. Like radical. Okay. And it was a recognition. There's a lot of good. So reverberation. You're saying sold a lot like radical. <laughs> I wish, uh, but it was as unclear on what it was about as okay. the word radical. So 2017. But they we like realized clearer, the, more direct exactly. titles. And so let's do that. So it's a second edition, but with a better title. And maybe more turning to what was to come in 2017. Zondervan brought out one of their four views books. Mm-hmm. This one on the church's mission, edited by Jason Saxton. And there you wrote the first chapter. And you interacted with Chris Wright, John Frankie, Peter Lightheart. What were you doing in this book? I'm presenting a the case for a more narrow and constrained understanding of the mission of the church. Kind of what Greg Gilbert and Kevin DeYoung had done, only not quite as constrained. Well, I tried to provide a lane for both saying, first and foremost, the mission of the church. What do you mean by the church? Well, let's just say the institutional church or the gathered church or whatever you want to call it. Can we is, call it the local church? Is well, no, because the local churches and its members who have jobs to do all week. Okay. So that's the thing. You, you just got to specify what you mean by okay. the church. Yeah. If we're talking about the church institutional in some sense, yes, it's a narrow mission, making disciples. If you're talking about the church as its members, what the people you're talking to on Sunday and what they're called to do all week, there is a broader mission. So what I try to do is both make the conservative case for a narrow mission, but also acknowledge why, why, why does somebody like Chris Wright get any traction? When he talks about a very broad, unconstrained 
version of the mission of the church. Well, he's saying true things. He's saying Christians should obey everything Jesus commanded. Yeah. You hear that? Oh, of course I should. Isn't my mission to obey everything Jesus commanded? Well, yes, of course it is. Mm-hmm. So the, in the conversation about the mission of the church, you need to give some way of talking about that. And so that's what I try to do in that chapter. Mm. 2018 saw two more books of yours come from the press. First, Crossroad brought out Rule of Love. Um, how the local church should reflect God's love and authority, which was really a summary and and sort of a refresh, which was meant to replace your first book, Surprising Offense. It was supposed to be a, a kind of a shorter version of it. And in message, it is a shorter version, but I ended up writing it more or less from scratch. So it is, it's not just me hitting the delete key on the long book. Yeah. Because the long is, book has a lot of useful examples yeah, in it. This right. doesn't have... But it is basically doing and saying the same things. That said, I am actually spending more time on just the idea of love in this because I've done so much subsequent work on membership and discipline. I let myself focus more on love in this one. So that's 2018. Second in 2018, you published a book on politics with Thomas Nelson that was endorsed by, among others, Jamar Tisby and John MacArthur. Uh, Probably 2018 was the last year that could have been done. (laughs) Uh, eight substantial 25-page chapters, decently large print, easy on the eye. Uh, what was your burden in this book, and did you get it done? My burden was twofold. Number one was to reframe the the help Christians think better about religion and politics. How the nations rage. How, they, how religion and politics do and don't fit together. Uh and church and state, what their responsibilities of each are. So in some ways, I'm trying to do kind of basic remedial instruction in political philosophy, political theology. I'm trying to do that without saying I'm doing that. And in- but at the same time, I'm also trying to speak to our present moment and help Christians do a better job of being in, but not of, the world hmm. of politics and churches especially. What does it mean to be in, but not of? So I'm trying to do that and provide basic instructions on political theology, political philosophy. So this is, in some ways, this is, you know, LSE Jonathan Lehman yeah. and Nine Marks Jonathan Lehman. Kind of coming together. Coming together. Here it all is. Yes. 2020 saw you publish a couple of titles in the short Crossway series. Sam Amadi, the, uh, Amadi is editing Church Questions. You did Is It Loving to Practice Church Discipline uh-huh. with Andy Nazelli. You did How Can I Love Church Members with Different Politics, playing mm-hmm. on this. Yeah, that's right. Any comment on just ho- this whole series or these two works in particular? Sam Amati has done a fantastic job. There's like 40 of them now. I have pastors mention this series to me all the time. It Man, is super really helpful useful. with their members. Oh, yeah. Um, I was a little skeptical of it at first because I was worried that, oh, no, this might get us publishing just about anything in the world. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, We've tried to constrain it on the whole to church-related yeah, matters. There's a yeah. few that go beyond things like yeah. – uh, you know, dealing with with with, with uh, uh, God's sovereignty and so forth. But yeah, no, it's been helpful. And uh, uh, the third one, I did a uh, mission of the church. Yeah. In, in 2020, you published one of your longest gestating titles with Crossway, and only three meaty chapters, one assembly, rethinking the multi-site and multi-service church models. Wow, swimming upstream much? Yeah. You know, one of the biggest benefits of writing that book was the process that you called for of getting five or six or seven or eight guys together yeah. in Washington to discuss the first draft. Yeah. They beat it up for a couple of days yeah. and then did a second draft yeah. uh, based on the feedback. What a productive way to write a book. Well, and, Goodness, to take and, the wisdom of those brothers. And we've been batting this one f- around for 10 years. So, yeah, so we've done the journal on this. Yeah, it was a long time deciding when when do we when, when do we when do we drop this book? When do we come out with this? Yeah, that's you know, right. When do you have the time to read and it? And we knew we kind of get one shot on this topic. Yeah. And so, brother, you, you had the one shot. How, how badly did you lose? <laughs> was this a 40 to 6 victory uh, or loss or, uh, you know, uh, a brother at Southwestern Seminary approached me at the SBC recently and thanked me for my work in this and said, but I've done my dissertation critiquing it. Yeah. Can I send it to you? Yeah. And uh, he sent it to me. I've, I've, I've skimmed it. I haven't, I haven't looked at it carefully. I need to. Um, so there are a number of people, and there have been a few others I've seen as well, coming out in response, offering critiques of this. And mm-hmm. I'm happy to have the conversation. Yeah. These two books are useful together. They're deeply related. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's hinge, kind of your ecclesiology. Some of the same principles. That's yeah. right. 
Um, twenty twenty one post COVID publishing with Crossway, the project with Colin Hansen, Rediscover uh-huh. Church. Yep. Uh, Why the Body of Christ is Essential in nine short digestible chapters. Yep. Enjoyed working with Colin. He's a sweet brother. Yeah. We 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 think alike in a lot of these matters. We 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 have some differences and different emphases, and those show up a little bit in the chapters, but not much. And uh, I think it's a useful book. I hope people will read. Uh, one one contributor to Crossway gave them money to print four hundred thousand copies of this. Wow! And distributed them to church three or four hundred thousand. So this is a kind of response to, to COVID, getting people back to church. Yes, that's exactly yeah. what it's meaning to do. And do we know as the Lord used it like that? I don't know. Hmm. I hope so. I don't know. 2022, you did another church question title you just mentioned a moment ago. What is the church's uh, yeah. mission? It's me trying to say the stuff in the Four Views book in a more popular level. So that a accessible. pastor could use this with his elders. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and I like this one. Yeah. I like it more than the chapter in the Four Views book. Fourth so. and final page. Goodness gracious. So uh, 2023 seems like it's already another banner year for your publishing brother. That's the year we're doing this interview. Uh, first, you've got a, a couple of short articles in B&H's new handbook on theology, oh, right. uh, one on church membership, uh, one on church and state. Yep. Any comments on these pieces or this handbook? Grateful to be included in that volume. Uh, they were fun things to write. It was just... Short. It was short and easy because it's stuff I've been talking about forever. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, second Useful and perhaps one. more significantly was this substantial article you wrote in Icon, but it was published back in the spring on does complementarianism lead to abuse? Yeah. You want to talk about that for a moment? I thought it was a good article, uh, solid. In fact, we're having the um, interns read it. What you do, you suggest and develop briefly seven theses. And by the way, that's kind of your style, isn't it? You come up with like propositions. Yeah. You'll like, here are six here are 10. Well, it's, it's a way to hang the reader's hat on something. Yeah. It makes it easy yeah. to follow. So, yeah. That's what yeah I'm but if, to if, do. if people get used to that, then they'll know that with Jonathan, you're going to get a part of the chapter or maybe most of the book will be like 11 statements. Yeah. That's here right. are five. So, in this, you, you do that. You do that really well here. You've got seven theses. Well, again, because you're trying to back to what we've talked about with authority, there is good and there's bad authority. Yeah. So you can't answer the question, does complementarian lead to abuse without... Which is a frequent charge these days. That complementarian is, that is the charge. There's two charges that are made. Number one, that it leads to abuse. Number two, you're denying women ability to use their gifts. Yeah. So you need to respond to those two. That's the apologetic yeah. that needs to be made in this moment. Yeah. Not like, is it biblical? That was the 80s, 90s conversation. Yeah. What's driving the conversation is the abuse and the gift. And so that's what I'm, I'm responding to in that and trying to say, well, look, yeah, abuse authority can be used terribly, but... Here's something that seems to be missing from a lot of egalitarians' understanding is that authority is actually a good thing yeah. and is yeah. used to, to create and give life. And so that's what I try to give voice to in that. One of the most interesting things you brought out in this for people who don't do as much reading on this as, as you, you may do uh, would be your second one where you said the data on male headship's correlation to abuse is mixed. Yeah. So you, you took a sort of common story in the press and you said, actually, when you look more closely, it's not quite what we're being told. Yeah, that's that's right. But at the same time, giving knowledge that, look, men abuse their authority. Of course. And yeah. and pastor complementarian brothers, you should be first in line. If you really care about manhood being used to protect womenhood or men protect women, you should be first in line to yeah. call up out all of these abuses. Why, why do we have to wait for the egalitarians yeah. To oppose abuse. Why aren't we opposing it? Yeah. That would seem to be right in the job description of what complementarianism calls for. So yeah. let's do and that. Then, yeah. Uh, of these five things I'm mentioning from this year, the third, you've edited a massive Church Matters journal oh, on uh, a new Christian authoritarianism. Uh, came out a few months ago with this uh, taping. Um, 300 pages, 60 of which you wrote. You wrote a fifth of this thing. <laughs> Um, you you did significant articles on a new Christian authoritarianism, uh-huh. on what authority has God given to governments, mm-hmm. and on say no to Christian nationalism. Yeah, you want to just give us your theses on each of those? What you're what you're saying in them? A new Christian authoritarianism, in a sentence, it's arguing that uh, the brothers who are calling for Christian theonomy, Christian magisterialism, or Christian nationalism are offering a authoritarian, and I mean that evaluatively, not just descriptively, uh-huh. but evaluate like bad, mm-hmm. a new form of authoritarianism that 
is both bad for people and contravenes scripture. That's what I, and I, but I start by sort of laying out the landscape sympathetically. This mm-hmm. is what they're saying. I tried. This is what they're trying to do. They're, I try to listen to them yeah. and put them in their best terms. And yeah. say, they're not all wrong. Yeah. They're concerns. That's that article. The other article. The what second, authority this, this, has God given to governments? Okay, that I admit is a, a reprint of the chapter on government from my authority book. So that's not fresh. It's not original to this. But the, I okay. took the chapter okay. on government yeah, yeah. from my okay. authority yeah, book. Yeah. Okay. Said, so it's just it preview. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And the third one, say no to Christian nationalism, is a study of the word name in scripture and how does God tie his name to his people hmm. and is adamant about his people reflecting his name and his character and marking them off mm. in the nation of Israel yeah. and then in the church. So then we take the word name of God and we apply it to a nation state today in some or for, form or fashion. You're working in opposition to the entire storyline of redemptive history. For people who for 10 years or so have been reading the Nine Marks Journal, yeah. uh, you know, if they're kind of feeling over them, the complementarianism when a few years ago was big. Mm-hmm. The journal on common. Yeah, that was a lot of work. And then, th- other than that, and probably more than that, this one mm-hmm. seems like it's almost out of uh, si- outsized compared to all the others. Wh- what's going on here? Why such a huge amount of effort on this topic? Number one, it's it's about the mission of the church, and we feel like the mission of the uh, of the church is under threat. In the way, in the past, back to say Kevin and Greg's book, you're yeah. responding to voices. What is on the mission the left. of the church? You're responding Kevin to Dion, voices Greg on the left Gilbert. and kind of progressivism, which will expand into social ministry, social justice, social gospel sorts of things. And 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 Kevin and Greg coming along and saying, no, it's narrow. It's making disciples. This is doing the same thing, but looking to quote unquote folks on the right uh-huh. who are wanting to expand the mission of the church into, say, saving the nation in some form or fashion. All for saving the nation and, yeah. and the way you mean it and the way you intend to, but that's not the mission of the church. we got to talk about the mission of the church. So that's what we're trying to do there. How did it get so long? In part because authors kept sending us stuff that was really long. We realized this is a complicated topic. Mm. It just it, it requires a 4,000-word essay instead mm. of a 1,000-word essay. And it re- enough requires four, nuance. requires nuance. And enough of those four 5,000-word essays show up, and they did. Voila, it's that thick. Uh, you also, number four, you have a significant chapter in another B&H edited volume, mm-hmm. Baptist Political Theory. Your chapter is Baptists in Babylon yeah. on the That's role the of politics it. in modern Baptist life, wherein there are six Lehmanesque theses <laughs> yes, that's right. or propositions that you sketch out. By the way, Carl F. H. Henry did his uh, God Revelation Authority the same way. He had 15 theses right. yeah. over those six volumes. Yeah. So you're kind of a child of Henry in that. Um where you really sketch out a Baptist political theology. theology. And it seems to me like it's a pretty good summary of your work so far. It really uh, we're, we're it actually needs having, to be. We're actually having the interns read it. It's not a very long chapter. Uh-huh. Uh, the average viewer at home in TV land could, uh, could read it. Baptists are often criticized by our Presbyterian and Anglican friends for saying, all you know how to talk about is religious freedom. And because the American experiment found that agreement, that gentleman's agreement, that conciliance between yeah. kind of enlightenment, classical liberalism thinking, and Baptist political theologians like yep. like Bacchus and Leland, in some sense, the cr- critics are right. We didn't have to talk about theories of government. Because the other stuff was being taken care of. It was of. being taken care of. All yeah. we had to talk about was religious liberty. Yeah. But now that other stuff's not being taken care of. We were a of. footnote to a received text. Yeah, well said. So now I, the received text has been modified. scrambled. And so now it's like, okay, well, what do we think about government and its job more carefully? Maybe we need a larger political theology. And so that chapter is my one chapter attempt to give voice through those six statements of, of what a Baptist political theology consists of. Well, you say first it begins with the church and baptism. Right? I enjoyed that. I just felt like that'd be kind of unexpected. <laughs> Starts with baptism. What? You Baptists, all you think about is baptism. I'm like, yes. Uh, Two, it insists on separating religious and political authorities as well as national and church identity. Yeah, that's getting into the church and state question as well as the Christian nationalism question. And yeah, they are separate. They are distinct. So I'm going to maintain a separation of church and state and nation and church. Absolutely. I think redempt that back to my Wellam Gentry political. Yeah. Uh, biblical theology, yes, and I'm, how the covenants are put together. I'm hoping to do a series uh, in January to May, Lord willing, called The Ancient World uh, from Genesis 5 to 11. So I may be relying oh. on you highly. 
in that time. Interesting. Uh, number three, it defines the state as a platform builder and the church as a sign maker. I think I'm going to write a little book on church and state. Uh huh. And I th- think that may be my title. Platform and sign. Uh, church as a uh, 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 pl- yeah platform builder and sign maker colon a biblical theology of church and state. Don't make it another sucker punch. We have this fun title and, and cover, and then you, you get inside, and it's, <laughs> no, it's more asphalt licking. <laughs> Don't do that, man. No, I won't. Don't do I that won't. to your reading public. Uh, number four assigns the state a narrow, protectionist, non utopian jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. Because some of our theonomist friends are trying to give it a perfectionist. Yeah. You have two, two theories of a state a narrow, protectionist, a broad, perfectionist. So right. Thomas Sowell, conflict of visions, constrained, more, unconstrained. So, yeah, or, or in some ways going back to you know the Greeks. Yeah. You know, Aristotle had a perfectionist yeah. vision, and the founders were more of a protectionist vision. And I think God gives Israel a perfectionist, be holy because I am holy, O Israel, represent me before the nation. But then that job doesn't go to the nation under the new covenant. That job of perfectionism goes to the church. Be holy because be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So in your preaching, you preach the totality of Christ's instruction. Yep. And you're calling them to a form of Christ likeness. That is to say perfectionism. But you don't rely on the state to, to do that. You ask the state to provide a platform in a very narrow lane of protecting lives. We pray lives. from 1 Timothy 2 as Paul instructs us. Exactly. Peaceful and quiet lives. Yep. Why do you do that? Because God wants all men to be saved. But is it the state's job to do that second part? No, it's the church's job to do that second part. So all the state is doing is, is this narrow protectionist platform building. Number five affirms religious freedom. That's kind of inherent in what you said. Yep, yep. And your last one, number six, I think it was your last one, you had six or seven? I think you had six. Six, I think six. Yeah, you had six. Encourages Christians to enter the public square as principled pragmatists with limited expectations. Yeah, I have, I have a chapter on that and how the nation's raid, but principled pragmatist. Principles. Principle. That there are certain rights and wrongs of justice, according to Scripture, that we're, we're calling to, calling for the state to uphold. So yeah. we're, we're, and, and we're doing so in a principled way. So we have principles we're pursuing, and uh, we're doing so in a principled way. But we're pragmatists in the, in the sense that you know, get it done however you can get it done, mm-hmm. Christians. You know, you persuade the legislature, win the court case, do what it takes. And Corey Higdon has a chapter in here on contemporary Baptist political theology. Billy Graham, mm-hmm. Charles Colson, Richard Land, Albert Moeller, Russell Moore, mm-hmm. and Jonathan Lehman. You are now the subject of chapters on this topic. It's, it's an eclectic list. Wow, you, you must be getting to be very old and accomplished. The fifth thing coming out after we do this interview, so I don't have a copy of the book. All I have is manuscript. New book with Crossway, continuation of your ever-refining dwelling mm-hmm. on authority, how godly rule protects the vulnerable, strengthens communities, promotes human flourishing. 280 pages in four parts. What is authority? Mm-hmm. What is submission? Five principles on how good authority works. There's your proposition style again. Mm-hmm. And finally, what good authority looks like in action. And in that last one, mm-hmm. uh, you give examples of the husband, the parent, the government, the manager, the church, and the elder. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Thoughts? Deeply, deeply grateful for the opportunity to kind of consolidate a lot of the principles in the other books in in, in this topic. And what's crucial about this, I think, and I don't know if I succeeded in in this, but I didn't want to write just an abstract book on an abstract topic like authority. I wanted to do it in a way that was genuinely helpful to pastors and fathers and husbands and parents and and workplace managers. So I say in the very first words, uh, I want to personally engage you in how you use your authority. In your second grade class at Amazon. Which requires me be personally engaged in myself. To that end, I've written a more conversational style. More important, I begin with a confession for me to write about the good kind of authority is to write better than I am. Mm. And I was deeply aware, I read a number of other books on authority before writing this, of course, 
how authors will often just say, Oh, those are the bad authority people. Mm -hmm. And to me, that just, it just felt like there was a certain lack of self-awareness in that. And I didn't Mm -hmm. feel like I could do that because I'm deeply aware of how I've poorly used my authority. So I can't talk about this topic without saying sinner here too. Yeah. Right. So that's why I I approached it in this way, both at the principle biblical level. And then how does this play out in those different domains Mm -hmm. you described? So it acts as a nice summary. Of a lot of your your life's work at 50. Yeah. Yeah. Which is just right around the corner. Really? We're one month. From turning 50. What is today? Say the 16th or the 17th? 16th. Okay. One month and one day from now I turn 50. Probably by the time people are watching this, you're mm-hmm. already 50. Mm-hmm. If the Lord has not returned. Is there another continent of ideas you're wanting to explore and explain if the Lord gives you another 10 to 20 years of writing and thinking? There's a few more books on this present continent. I was talking with Steve Meyer the other day. Remember Steve, Discovery Institute, Intelligent Discovery Design, Institute. Yeah. Steve 65. And Steve is saying, yeah, I think I've basically done, you know, the contributions I want to make to the intelligent design mu- movement. There's some other things I want to do now. Yeah. A, 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 f- a few more on this continent, but other continents, I have You're going to write a novel. I have a, no, I don't think I have that skill. Uh, One of your daughters is going to write a novel. I will uh, be fun. I you might know. edit it. We'll, we'll see. Um, I have a, in my notes section of my computer, I have a, a file called Girl Dad. So at some point, I might write a book called Girl Dad, hmm. just about raising daughters. That's good. That's something I've been developing some awareness of mm-hmm. in the last few years. So maybe that, we'll, we'll see. Uh, hopefully a, a fun book, um, but instructive book. Other area, other continents more largely... Nothing comes to mind right now, no. Mm. I feel like the Lord is giving me this continent of authority and structures and institutions and keys of the kingdom and the state and how these things work together. And that's that's my jam. That's what I'm called to talk about. Mm. And we'll see if it has much more legs to it. Uh, but I can't think of another continent I, I should be stepping onto. Mm. Thanks for your life and work, brother. Thanks for the conversation.